I was just finishing up a meeting with a major investor who had brought in their portfolio manager. They had hung up the phone, or thought they had. And I could hear the portfolio manager say, the CFO is a chick. <laughs> Out of the corner of my eye, I could see Steve, the head of investor relations, who's diving across the desk. He's trying to hit the phone. I looked at him and I said, no. I wanted to hear it. I wanted to hear what they had to say. But at the same time, I couldn't breathe. And time just stood still. The reply was, the CFO is a chick, but yes, she's a geek chick. <laughs> geek chick. <laughs> I decided that was OK. <laughs> and then they moved on. They recognized that I was different. And then they moved on to business. And I knew it was different because whenever I would go in to meet with a prospective investor, I would have an uncontrolled visible reaction. And, you know, I got it. At that point in time, I was traveling in a pack of men. I was meeting with someone. I would go in. I'm a young woman. And they were about to make a $100 million investment decision. I just didn't fit the profile. What I learned to do was weave a story in my head that when I saw that reaction, I would tell myself, I'm immediately memorable. So when they get the reaction, those are the words would play. I used to wear an Iron Man watch under my suit. It was my own little personal rebellion. And I would reach up and touch it every once in a while. And it would remind me that, yes, I'm a woman, and I'm a CFO but I'm also an athlete. See, I grew up in an environment where you didn't have to pick a lane in life. I grew up in a really small town in northern Maine with 400 people on a working farm. My parents divorced when I was two, and my mother remarried this wonderful man who had five children. It's kind of like the Brady Bunch, but it was a really poor community. My mother wanted to make sure her three daughters were ridiculously independent. Um, and what that meant is she wanted to make sure that we had the freedom of choices in life. She encouraged us to push through the discomfort of trying something new. And her motto was, why not? Which meant that when I was old enough to see over the steering wheel, I drove the hay truck, big truck. I would say it's, like it's a great lesson in accountability, because if you pop the clutch and you knock the hay off the back, you had to get out and pick it up. <laughs> <laughs> it also meant that we learned how to bike, we learned how to ski through the force of gravity. We were unceremoniously pointed down hills, and that's how we learned. My mother took to heart the concept that she was raising young adults. And I think in part because of her, but also in part because you, when you grow up in a small community, everybody has to contribute. I didn't have to pick. I was a cheerleader. I played soccer. I was able to be captain of the math team. I wasn't put into a box, and my image didn't define who I was. And I had my mom in the background telling me that I could be whatever I wanted to be, as long as I was willing to work for it. She'd also say that life is unfair. And there are going to be lots of time where you're going to be working against a deck of cards that are stacked against you. She wanted to make sure that education was the key. And she talked a lot about the idea that she wanted to make sure that each of us built enough financial independence that we had freedom of choice. And that became a really big deal when I became CEO of that same public company. Almost the same exact moment that I became CEO, I became pregnant with my first child. Which meant, just a few months into this big new job, I had to tell our board that I was pregnant. Now, I have a huge amount of respect for our board. I look up to them. And I felt like somehow I was disappointing them. It 
felt a little bit like what it must be like to tell your parents you're having sex. <laughs> Yeah, their job is to make sure that the company is protected, that it's running well, and that you're following the Security and Exchange Commission's disclosure rules. And those rules ended up becoming a much bigger deal than I had anticipated. You see, when we did research, we couldn't find another single example of a woman who had become pregnant while CEO of a public company. Not one. So it's 2014. So, I spent lots of time with lawyers, with our PR firm, with our IR firm, and with our board, trying to determine the most appropriate way to disclose the fact that I was pregnant and that I was going to have a maternity leave, which meant that I did an interview with the Wall Street Journal, and my neighbors found out I was pregnant by reading the newspaper. I felt incredibly vulnerable. You know, something that was such a deeply personal experience that was out in the public, publicly disseminated, that I didn't have long to wait. The reaction was swift. I was flooded with notes from women, from fellow employees, who told me all these magical stories about their own families, and by men who sent me notes, who talked to me about the importance of being able to show publicly that you could do both, that you could have a family and that you could have a career, because they had daughters. And suddenly I felt a whole new set of emotions, pressure. I felt highly responsible to be able to show this publicly, which was interesting because I know so many women who have had big careers and families. But I think that we learn not to talk about it because somehow that will make us seem less effective. And maybe I would have chosen that. But I think talking about it normalizes it. And when you normalize it, you make it clear that you can have a career at any level and a family. I went to this event years ago where they had done research around female political candidates. And what they learned is that if you had a woman giving a speech right next to a man, saying exactly the same words, that you could not hear the woman if she had bad hair. If the hair was okay, you could hear them equally. I know a piece of this is true in business. I remember years ago, having one of our board members saying to me, you know, Melissa, I can't always tell if you're getting off your bike or if you're going into a board meeting. I've learned over the years how to play golf, I learned how to play poker, and I learned how to control my curly, frizzy locks. I learned how to conform just a little bit. But I am fierce about making sure that I stay unique to who I am. I don't want to be like everybody else. I think average is average. It's safe, but it's kind of boring. When we announced that I was pregnant, the stock didn't move. When we announced that I was going on a maternity leave, the stock didn't move. Which meant that two years later, when I had my twins, we had a brief conversation around governance and disclosure, but I could tell people myself. We had cleared the path that it was okay, that business cared about business. And our results have been really good. In 2014, we were just over 800 million in revenue. In 2018, we were 1.5 billion. In 2019, we made Fortune Magazine's top, top 100 growth stocks. So, who knows? Maybe having all those kids made us better. <laughs> I was recently interviewed by one of our interns 
And you were in this group of all of our interns, and she's this brilliant young woman in her 20s. She's studying her master's degree, and she is originally from India. And she made her way through a list of questions, and then she ended on one that she said was deeply personal based on her own experience as a woman. And she said, Melissa, why do I get asked questions like, why do you have to be so ambitious? She said, I don't think any man gets asked that question. And sometimes, she went on to say, people of my own age, women of my own age, ask me those things. How do you deal with it? And what she really wanted to know was, how do I deal with being judged? And I was sad, and I was angry in that moment, because we're supposed to make things better for the people that follow behind us. Now, what I said to her was something that I feel deeply. I think it's important to be open and hear what people have to say. Feedback is a gift, and it's an important part of your career. As a woman, I think it's incredibly important to clamp down that inner voice that is often telling you that you're not good enough. There's enough legitimate difficulty and judgment that's going to come your way. You simply can't pile on top of that. You will be judged. Life is not fair. You are the keeper of your narrative. It's your story. Take risks in life. Pick multiple lanes. And live the unique life that you want to live. Thank you.